Hi, I'm Dr. Matt and welcome to this lecture on carpal tunnel syndrome. Now in this video, we'll firstly define what carpal tunnel syndrome is. We'll look at the cause of it. We'll look at the risk factors for it. We'll look at the common clinical manifestations. So the signs and symptoms. Now we'll put all this into a concept map. So I'll do a concept map shortly to explain how all these things fit together. And then finally, we'll have a quick look at how would you diagnose this syndrome and how would you treat it? Okay, so let's start with the definition. So carpal tunnel syndrome, it's a syndrome, so it's a clustering or a complex of symptoms, signs and symptoms. I'm, today I'm gonna to call it clinical manifestations. Now, why? Well, it's to do with the compression, squashing, or traction in of the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, which is in the wrist. I'll go through the anatomy again shortly. But let's get all over the definition. What is it called? Well. It's usually, you'll see in the textbooks or in the literature, it's known as a peripheral neuropathy. That's what it's referred to clinically. So peripheral meaning outside, neuro, nerves, pathy, disease. So it's a nerve disease, but peripheral. So that means it's not spinal cord, not brain. So peripheral nerves, neuropathy, disease of peripheral nerves. Now, there's usually a word that they put at the front is it's a mono because mono meaning one. So it's a one nerve disease. Okay. Opposed to a polo, sorry, a poly neuropathy, which is like diabetic neuropathy it affects many peripheral nerves in the body. This is mono. It's one. In this case, it's median nerve. Finally, there's a few categories of mono peripheral neuropathies. Sometimes you can get traumatic mono peripheral neuropathies like a laceration or a a crushing like through a fracture or a motor vehicle accident or something. But this one is an entrapment. So the technical definition of carpal tunnel syndrome is an entrapment mono peripheral neuropathy, which basically means the nerve, one nerve is getting squashed. Where is it getting squashed? It's getting squashed in the carpal tunnel, which we can now go through. All right. So let's say you look at your wrist right here. You can see these risk creases. So there, there's kind of three there, or at least two. If you were to go to the furthest one along, the distal one, and then do a cut through. So if you were to cut your wrist off at that point, straight through there and look in, this is the carpal tunnel. Okay. So what do we see? Well, at the back here, these structures here are the carpal bones. So here we've got the hamate, there we've got the capitate, there we've got the trapezoid, and there we have the trapezium. So if this is going to be your carpal tunnel, meaning this is the entry point going into your palm, the posterior part is going to be formed by the capitate and the trapezoid carpal bones. Medially, we have the hamate. Laterally, we have the trapezium. So there's your boundary. So this will be the carpal arch. So this is concaved. It's the arch. All right. So we've got the lateral border, the medial border, the posterior border. What about the top? What about the roof? Well, that would be the green thing here, which two names, it could be the transverse ligament or the flexor retinaculum. Either way, it's a connective tissue roof top for the carpal tunnel. Now we have the tunnel. So now you can see in here, we have the tunnel. This is the carpal tunnel. What's in it? All right, so it's got nine tendons, and one nerve. Okay, so this is the contents of the carpal tunnel. Let's start in the deepest point. So these blue circles, one, two, three, four. This is the tendons for the flexor digitorum profundus, which is going to digit two, three, four, and five to flex it right at the distal ends. So this is to do this movement. So that would be that one, that one, that one, that one. So that's the deep group. On top of this, we've got another four. This is unlike the profundus, which means deep. This is superficialis. So it's not gonna go as far into the digits. It's gonna be more proximal. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. That's eight tendons done. We've got one to go. There's the other one. So what's left? We've got this thing. This is the pollucis, thumb. You wanna flex it. So that's gonna be the flexor pollucis longus, which is gonna go down into the thumb. So that's the nine tendons done. What we're left with, we're left with the nerve, the red nerve, which is the median nerve, okay. Part of the brachial plexus, at this point, it's coming through there to supply some muscles 
in the thena, the thumb, as well as some lumbricals. Sensory, it's going to give sensation to, we'll go thumb, so first digit, second digit, third digit, this is on the palm side, and half of the fourth digit, the lateral portion. So that's the sensory part for the median nerve, and at the back, a little bit of thumb, and these digits here, just at the top. Okay, so that's sensory and motor. Okay, we're, so we've formed the anatomy, we understand the tunnel now, we know where the median nerve is. Essentially, we know the definition, which is a neuropathy of that nerve being entrapped, so it's squashed in this. So now we can kind of figure out what's going to be the etiology. Okay, so etiology, meaning cause. Technically, it's idiopathic. They're not really 100% sure. They generally, this is literature, they generally assume that it's multifactorial, many things, but it's probably safe. It's due to an increased pressure in the carpal tunnel, I'll call it CT. So it's increased pressure in there. So that's the etiology. Okay, what are the risk factors? Risk factors being probably the biggest, what well, age would be a risk factor, okay, but I'm not going to include it today because it's going to be harder to justify how it fits in. But risk, age, as you get older, your risk of this is increasing. A strong risk factor is the female sex, about three times more likely for females to get it than males. So female is a risk factor. Another one is obesity. That's about a two times fold increase. So BMI. Um, next, we have pregnancy. So about 25% of pregnant females will develop carpal tunnel syndrome. And a really strong one is occupation. Now, what occupation? Well, usually manual ha handling um, occupations like using hammers, drills, using a lot of force in your hands, vibrating tools like drills, etc., jackhammers is going to increase that risk. So I'm going to leave those as the four most common risk factors. Now, what about the clinical manifestations? This meaning signs and symptoms. Now, so we're going to crush, squash, entrap the, the median nerve. So it's probably going to cause pain. That's very common. It's also going to cause paresthesia, which means numbness, pins and needles. Okay. Para Anesthesia. Um, if it's a, going into a more severe state of carpal tunnel, you're going to get weakness. And then if you look at the thena group, you might also see some atrophy, which essentially just means a reduction in the bulk of the musculature in that part of your hand. All right, so let's now put this into a concept map to make sense of how it all comes together. So the starting point, I'll put it in red. So I'll put this etiology in red. Being an increased pressure in the carpal tunnel. So that is the starting point. That's, that's the cause of the carpal tunnel. Now, what would lead to this? Okay, well, one common cause, and this would be the risk factors. is a reduction, a decrease in the carpal tunnel size. So if you were to have a smaller carpal tunnel, just smaller um, for whatever reason, that would therefore increase the pressure in the tunnel and more likely to entrap the, the median nerve. So um, females, this is where the female fits into it. I'll put here. Female, remember it's three time fold increase. Females proportionally would have a smaller cross section of their carpal tunnel in comparison to males. So that would increase the likelihood of decreased carpal tunnel size, therefore increased pressure. Other conditions like just congenital, um, it's just the anatomy that you're born with. So this would have a genetic underpinning to um, you're more likely to have a smaller carpal tunnel size, therefore greater pressure in the carpal tunnel space. Okay, what else? What else could increase pressure? Well, structures are increased. So incre increase the size of structures in, in the carpal tunnel. Okay, the big one would be, because what did we say was, was in it? Nine tendons, one nerve. Well, something to do with the tendons. So if you were to have swollen tendons, so this would be a tendinopathy or tendonitis, and that would strongly come from occupation. So if you have jobs that you're using your fingers, your hands repetitively, 
with a lot of force or as I said vibrational tools can increase the change in tendons so you get tendinopathies or swelling of the tendons that means the structures increase in size puts pressure within the carpal tunnel you then entrap the nerve interestingly also pregnancy um, a side effect of pregnancy from the hormones is fluid retention now that's going to be everywhere in the body but in this case it's going to cause fluid retention I'm not 100% sure if it's tendons or within the, the nerve itself or within other structures like fat or something within the tunnel, but in any case, it's going to increase the size of the structures, which then increases the pressure. Okay. Finally, obesity. In the literature, it's still not 100% sure how that fits in as a risk to the cause. It seems that there's a stratification. So um, people who are obese that are a younger age seems to have a different causal link um, than older larger people. So in the elderly who are obese, they seem to have carpal tunnel on both sides, whereas younger people who are more likely to be obese seems to be more unilateral. So the cause of the obesity is unknown. Okay, so let's go from the starting point. So we've ticked off the risk factors, how they fit into it. We know now we've got an increased pressure in this carpal tunnel. So it, it's a closed space, there's an increased pressure in it now. So as the pressure goes up, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to compress the median nerve. I'll just put it MN. So you've got the nerve there sitting in there. Remember the median nerve is on the outside is the epineurium, which is like a collagen wrap. In here, we've got fascicles. In there is the perineurium, which are gonna be your blood vessels. And then in here, you're gonna have endoneurium, more connective tissue, wrapped up in myelin. The myelin is the insulation of the axons, okay? So if you start to compress it, you're gonna have an effect on the blood flow. So it seems that compressing the median nerve will eventually lead to vascular changes. Either blood, blood can't get out or blood can't go in. But in any case, we'll say it causes a form of ischemia to the nerve. Okay, so you're starting to get ischemia to the nerve. Now, if that was intermittent, so it wasn't there all the time, so I'll call this intermittent, what would happen is you'd start to, particularly with the big um, sensory fibers, start to squash them, that they start to become dysfunctional and you will get sensory changes. Now, what did we see? Paresthesia is a big one. So you would start to get, and I'll do this in green. So you get paresthesia. Numbness, pins and needles, because you're getting intermittent blood vessel change or uh, blood flow change to the sensory nerves, which is causing numbness. Now this is particularly seems to be worse at night. Number of reasons why this could be. Well, when you're sleeping, you could be either putting your wrist in a lot of flexion as you sleep under the pillow or too much extension and that would then put pressure and increase um, the pressure within the carpal tunnel which would then worsen the ischemia than the sensory change. Also when you're asleep in, you're probably more aware or when you're in bed you're more aware you have less distractions so the more likely to make it worse. Another, another theory is that when you're not moving your arms you're not getting your flow of fluid through lymphatics back, so you're more likely to have a bit more edema. Therefore, the fluid retention, increase in size and structures, whether it's tendon or the nerve, increase the pressure, increasing and worsening the ischemia, they're the sensory changes. So you're also gonna have the pain. So that's the sensory changes, okay? Now, for these patients, which are maybe more minor at this point, it seems to be relieved by shaking your wrist, resting it, okay? Um, put it under warm water, and this seems to get rid of the intermittent uh, effects. Now, if the ischemia worsens or continues, so it becomes chronic, what's going to happen is that nerve isn't getting enough blood, therefore it's going to start to become injured. So we'll, we'll say nerve injury, inflammation. So what that means is with inflammation, we get more swelling, more edema. This is going to worsen this whole process. So it's just going to feed back on itself. But ultimately, what this is going to lead to is demyelination. So the axons that are myelinated, the myelin will either start to, to peel off, die off, or lessen in thickness, and so we're gonna get demyelination. Now, at this point, you still might not know anything worse than this, so we might not know that this is getting more severe, 
unless you were to do a diagnostic test. So if the doctor was to order a test, which we call a nerve conduction study, okay, so what this essentially is, is sending electrical impulses down the nerve and recording from the structures that the median nerve innervates. So we can do um, record from the muscle in the Thena group, or we can record from sensory um, skin and see how well the nerve conducts it. So if you were to do a nerve conduction test, put the prongs where the median nerve is, send electrical information down there and record from the muscle, what you would expect to see is you send your stimulus, then you get a response in the Thena group where you get something like this, which we call a compound muscle action potential, which is basically an action potential from all the muscle fibers. And what you would do is you would measure time from when you gave the stimulus to when you saw a response. Okay, and so this is in the nerve conduction test done by a neurophysiologist. And that time, which is what we call onset or latency, that would give you an indication of how quick the speed is. Now, if you're losing myelin, remember myelin speeds up the signal. If you lose it, that will widen. So that would actually give you an indication that you're losing myelin, particularly in the thena, which is the muscles, or you could do the sensory recordings over here from skin. But in any case, if you do have a widening of onset, that would indicate that you are having some carpal tunnel changes. Now, if this continues to worsen, so the demyelination, so the myelin is now getting peeled off, dying off, that means the axon's not protected, that means you now get axonal loss. So now your axons of the nerve are dying, so you're reducing number. Okay, so if you do that, you're going to, this is now going into a more severe state of carpal tunnel and what you're going to start to see is weakness because you've got less axons going to your muscles to tell them to contract and you're going to get atrophy. Okay, so this is going down to the severe form of carpal tunnels because you're now losing axons. If you were to do the nerve condu conduction test now, what you'd also see is because you've got less axons, you've got less amplitude. So this size will start to drop down and that's giving you an indication of it's really becoming more severe. What else can be done? So how else would the person be diagnosed? Well, all the clinical manifestations. So the patient presenting with this is a good sign of carpal tunnel. You can bring on the, the effects. So if you were to get a patient and put their hands out like this and then dorsiflex, Okay, sorry, flex like this, then you would kind of bring on the paresthesia pain in the dermatome of the median nerve, or you could do a Phelan test, which you do like this and hold it for a minute. And again, if you were to recreate the pain and the paresthesia in the area of the median nerve, that would be also sensitive to carpal tunnel, or you could do a tinnel test, which is you kind of tap on where the median nerve is, and if that tap in then, or percussion, brings on that kind of pain or the paresthesia, that would be an indication that there may be some car carpal tunnel compression. Finally, so that's diagnosis. Finally, how's it treated? Well, again, it would be based on whether it's a minor, a moderate, or a severe. In the minor, we might just have minor changes that we saw here, and that might just be managed through splinting, or taking pressure to reduce the pressure within the carpal tunnel. Moderate, okay, where you may have more severe signs and symptoms as well as changes in nerve conduction studies. You may use some anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids and they may inject the corticosteroids into the carpal tunnel to take the swelling, to get rid of the size of the structures, particularly the tendon, if it comes from the occupation. And then severe, if it's really bad, so we see the axonal loss, demyelination, bad pain, and then motor changes, atrophy, weakness. We may have to do, or well, the surgeon have to do a release here. So somehow change the, the roof of it to give more space. So to increase the space of the carpal tunnel, which hopefully then can rectify the problem. So there you have it. That is carpal tunnel syndrome in a nutshell. Hopefully now you understand the risk factors, etiology, clinical manifestations, how is it diagnosed and how it's managed.